All right, so um, this presentation, as I said, is about selling your home. And particularly, I wanted to do a presentation like this because I often hear, or actually, I really don't hear. It's like something that we hear after the fact from people is that they were nervous about the process. They didn't know what was what it was going to be like. And so what are they supposed to do when they're selling their house? So here we go. If you are a homeowner or even if you are inheriting a home, um, because we are in, in that position now, um, for anybody in their 30s, 40s, 50s, you may be inheriting a home and you may need to go through the process of selling it. So I will try to touch on that a little bit as we go through here. So why is it a good time to sell? Number one reason is because according to Forbes and all of these other companies and our statistics here locally, um, homeowners are sitting on a record amount of equity because the prices have gone up the way that they have. Um, you guys will hear me say real estate is very local so you have to be somewhat careful when you're listening to national statistics because real estate can change state by state even neighborhood by neighborhood some neighborhoods sell faster and better than others neighborhoods sell higher than others so it's very very specific so when you're looking at the national headlines yes that's great but also come back and consider what is actually happening locally in your market and that is where your real estate professionals are going to be the experts uh, so this is me for anybody who doesn't know me um, welcome I'm glad that you're here maybe you're watching this as a replay I'm Rashida Clark uh, I am a Hampton Rose native uh, grew up in Hampton went to high school in Hampton went to Old Dominion University so I've been all around the Hampton Rose area I have been selling real estate in Hampton Roads for eight years. And then before that, I worked in local government with planning and zoning. Um, and I also have done a lot of work with market analysis for banks, which is why I'm pretty good, I think, at pricing homes, because I used to do a lot of it um, for banks when they were pricing foreclosures, short sales, even refinances. Um, so I've done a lot of pricing for homes that I've sold, homes that banks have sold, homes that my clients have bought, all of the above. Uh-oh, that's not supposed to happen. Sorry. Hold on. Click too far. Click too far. All right. So today's market. You have heard, and it is true, it's not just us crying wolf. There is a record no number of listings, record low number of listings. Real estate is supply and demand. Simply put, we need supply, we have demand, but we don't have enough supply, so there is an issue. Same thing as, you know, you go into the, the store during the pandemic and there was no toilet paper. We go to the store now, I can't find my favorite orange juice. There is a supply issue and it's causing a demand issue. Now, we don't have a significant amount of buyers in the market. So I hear people say this a lot and they're saying, you know, everything's gonna crash, it's gonna be like it was in 2009. You know, I don't really think so. And, and I'm gonna explain why. Number one, this is um, normal. This is a normal amount of demand. There aren't there isn't a flood of buyers that's suddenly come into the market. This is a normal amount of buyers for our area that are looking for houses. The issue is people aren't wanting to move, whether it's for COVID, whether it's because they're unsure about their job, whether whatever the reason is, people aren't moving out of their houses. So people aren't listing houses. Then you also have on the new construction side an issue with getting materials. So there is a lot of things happening that is causing a issue with creating available homes for buyers in the market. So as I said, listings are at record lows, equity is at record highs. So for people who are wanting to actually sell their home, it is a good time to do that. For anybody that loves graphs, this is for you, okay? This actually starts in 2014 and it goes 
all the way to December. So we know our data is always a little behind, okay, because we've got to look at numbers and things all the way to the end of the month. We're only in, you know, halfway through January. Most of the things will probably be in so we can update this soon, but this gives you a good idea. So you can see how things have changed over time. So the first time it got really low, um, well, the lowest that we saw at first was right like mid uh, COVID, I guess we could say. So this is probably September of 20. Then it dropped again in January, uh, February of 21. And now November, it's back down almost to the same level it was in February. So the listings are just significantly low. And I know we say that, I know I say that to buyers a lot. Whether they really understand what that means, um, I'm not really sure. I think everybody just thinks we're like, you know, blowing smoke. But really and truly, there are not enough houses. Having sold in a buyer's market in the middle of the the um, the recession, the economy trying to come back, I sold in that market. And of course, there were tons. I mean, there were, I would have a buyer looking for a house, you know, in the 200 price point, there may be 50 houses on their list. Now I'm talking about if, if I have a buyer right now looking for $200,000 house, whether it's an attached house, a detached house, a condo, whatever, I, they may have 10 houses, maybe have 10 houses on their list for an entire city or two or three cities. So it is significantly low. And here's another chart for anybody that really wants, you know, likes numbers. Um, this is just for December. So this is divided, it says monthly, but you know, but you can see how prices have just inched up. So when prices inch up, that means that you have equity, right? Because you build equity, number one, through market appreciation. Number two, by paying your mortgage down. So when the market goes up, you have equity. So let's talk about the steps to list so that I can break these down for you and kind of make try to make it as simple as possible so it's not it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Number one, we're going to talk about market analysis, looking at your mortgage statement, agent uh, interview so that you know how to hire the right person. I mean, hopefully you will hire me, but in case you don't, I want you to make sure you're hiring the right agent. Determining your next move, so where are you going after you sell this house, and then preparing your home for the market. Market analysis. This is an important one um, that is often confused and people a lot of times may look at Zillow and different things like that and try to come up with prices. But a market analysis, a true market analysis, there is a science to it, okay? The first thing that we do is that we have to look at past sales. This is the same thing that appraisers do. So we're not appraisers, but obviously we, we talk to appraisers all the time. We use a lot of the methods that they use. Um, so we go back, ideally three months, no more. But at this point now, we're having to go back six months, sometimes a year. We go back in time to see what has sold in your neighborhood specifically. And I prefer it to be a half mile, maybe a mile radius around you. After I find out what's sold, I'm also looking at the condition of that house and whether the location of that house is similar to yours. So I give you an example. There are some house, some neighborhoods that have waterfront property um, and there's a mix of non-waterfront and waterfront. So if I'm valuing your house, I need to compare that with another waterfront property. We also don't compare homes um, that are foreclosures to regular sales. So I know there used to be a lot of worry when people go, oh, they're going to let that home foreclose. It's going to mess up my home's value. Not really, because we have to use a traditional sale, compare it to a traditional sale. We can't use a distressed sale, which is what we call it. A distressed sale is a foreclosure, short sale. Um, or some other uh, a court ordered sale that is a distress sale we don't use those to compare to regular sales so when we are making this comparison 
<clears throat> it is really apples to apples as much as possible. Number of bedrooms, number of square foot, location in the neighborhood, you know, um, condition. Have you updated your kitchen? Have they updated updated their kitchen? Is the flooring new? As much as we can get, that is how we use this particular um, tool to come up with the value. Then the next thing I want you to do is look at your mortgage statement. So this is, your mortgage statement is not an official payoff, but it gives you a very good idea. Um, if you get an official payoff, it may be a few dollars, maybe even a few hundred dollars off here or there, depending on how um, your interest has accrued, um, if you pay down a little bit more one month or the other, or even what time of the month that you request that payoff. So just look at your mortgage statement for now and use that as a way to compare uh, what your what you owe to what you think you can get. So that was that's what the market analysis does. It gives you an an idea of value, and we're going to compare that to what you owe. So in order for us to get an idea of what you might be able to gain when you sell, we're simply going to subtract your estimated value from the market analysis from what you owe on the mortgage statement. That's the, that gives us the best estimate. Now, let's just keep it simple. Let's say the market analysis says you can get $200,000 for your house and your mortgage statement says you owe $150,000. So generally, you know you're going to be able to get about $50,000 to sell when you sell your house. To interview agents, this is the other one because this is a big one that you kind of need to start doing earlier on um, because every agent can have certain um, ways that they want to market your property. They have certain things and you know that they like to do with their seller. So interviewing agents should probably be your next step. I've got a couple of questions here that I want you guys to consider. So number one, what methods do they use to determine your value? So you kind of want to get a good idea of whether they actually know how to do a market analysis. No, this is not something that is taught in real estate school. It is an art uh, and it comes with experience. And I cannot tell you how many agents do not really know how to do a market analysis and pinpoint value. Why is this so important? Because you need someone that's going to give you um, very detailed information about how they're pricing your house and you want that information to be accurate because you don't want to get an inflated view um, of your value and then come to find out you can't really get that so you need someone to tell you the truth um, there used to be years ago agents that would kind of go into uh, what we call listing presentations so <clears throat> when you're interviewing agents you're really going to be in a, a listing presentation that's the formal name for it but they will go into presentations and they give the, the seller the highest possible value they think they can get for their house because it's a way for them to win more listings and so they say oh seller i can give you another t i can get you an extra twenty thousand dollars over whatever that other agent told you well they can't because simply put the market is what it is unless you literally and truly have something in your home above and beyond what every other house in that neighborhood has and i mean something significant it is very unlikely that you're going to get 20 or 30 or whatever thousand dollars more for your house than your neighbor got. So when I talk to my sellers, I try to keep it very realistic. Be realistic so that you're not angry, you're not heartbroken, you're not upset, whatever the case may be. As we're going through the process, you need to main, I want to manage your expectations. So when you get that market analysis, you know this is a very strict estimate of what I can get and I have a good idea of what I'm going to walk away with when we go to the closing table. So that's why I harp so much on the first one. <clears throat> what issues might you face when you go through the home inspection and the termite inspection? This is a good one to ask them because as, as you kind of walk around your house with the agent that you're interviewing, so ideally you'd be interviewing them on site. 
um, or through video, because with COVID, I've done a couple video walkthroughs. You need an agent that can look at your home and pinpoint things that could potentially be an issue, whether it's for home inspection, the termite inspection, or even appraisal. So there are certain stipulations for all of those things. And there are some things that just kind of stand out. You know, they stick out like a sore thumb. So those things are you want an agent that's savvy enough to know what those are and they can give you a full warning. And even some of those things you may want to get ahead of um, as far as having it addressed before you list, or maybe it's something that we put into the listing to say, here are some things that we already know are issues. We've, we've adjusted the price for this. So we have made some type of arrangement to address this. So that's important. You need to know how much they charge in commission and what if there are any additional fees and things that go along with that. So generally, average commission is between three and say 5% um, of the sales price. When you purchase the home, okay, you don't pay anything for representation. All of the commissions are paid by the seller. Most of the cost for repairs and things like that are paid by the seller. So now you're in a seller's position. So the commissions are gonna be paid by you. So you want to know what is going to be paid, what has to be paid out of your proceeds because there's no money that needs to come up front from you. So whatever needs to be coming out of your proceeds, you wanna know that so that you can have an idea of what you're really gonna walk away from after the sale. Generally speaking, so I uh, listing commissions, listing commissions can be between three and 5%, but total amount to sell your home, we tell sellers to estimate between 10 and 12%. That can vary depending on different situations, different locations, but that is a good number. 10 to 12% is gonna cost you to sell your home. And that includes commissions, your closing costs, any types of repairs that you may have to do, um, and possibly paying closing costs, even though we're in a market right now where you don't have to really pay closing costs, which is a great thing. Closing costs for the buyer. You still have your own closing costs. Um, specifically, how will they market your home? What are they going to do? They should have some sort of marketing plan. Um, we're in a market right now, sometimes, where you can just simply list a home and then it sells itself, but the market is so up and down. It slows down. It picks back up. You, we really don't know. So they need to have some type of plan in order to market your home and get it sold and get it sold at the price that you want. As if they will represent you exclusively or if they may consider being a, a dual agent. So a dual agent is somebody that represents both buyer and seller. So they represent both parties. Yes, it is legal, but if you're concerned about that or you wanna be made aware of that kind of thing up front, have that conversation. Um, personally, I do not like being a dual agent. So you, you may have some agents that tell you, hey, I, don't, I prefer not to do that. When I get calls about your home and they want me to write the offer for them, I'm likely going to refer it to another agent. That is typically how I handle it. But you need to know for sure what they're going to do. How will the offers be analyzed? When you receive an offer, we, will, we go through it with you and we have certain things that we're looking for. Um, of course, we're looking for a pre-approval letter, but in addition to that, there are ways that agents can call and uh, vet that pre-approval letter with a lender. Um, there are certain things we can ask, there are certain things we can't, but most of your very savvy agents, like myself, to my own horn, we do call and vet um, buyers with the lender. <clears throat> That meaning we double check what that their letter is is legit. We want to make sure that they've actually done the things that they say they've done. Um, and then finally, do they have reliable contractors that they can refer you to? Because it is likely that they that you may have to do some kind of repairs. You know, they, now we're luckily in a seller's market, uh, which means the sellers have the advantage. Simply put. So we're in a seller's market. So are, there are some, some things that you most likely will not have to do. However, you do still have buyers in the market that are using um, specific types of loans like VA, for example. We're, we're a big military community. 
government loans have very specific um, requirements as far as the condition of the house. So let's say, for example, you've got some rotting wood around the trim in, on your, the exterior of your home. If I come and walk through your home and I see that rotting wood, I'm going to tell you right then that is not going to pass an appraisal for any government loan. And so we need to have that. We need to try to have that fixed or prepare to have it fixed um, before you get to closing because that's something that you don't, we, we don't need to be worried about having to do that and run into that issue. So referring contractors um, is ideal. Someone that is licensed, someone that we work with, someone that we can trust. And I'm clicking too far. All right. So preparing your home for the market. Number one, declutter. Number one, absolutely declutter, deep clean it. Um, start packing up your stuff. Now, it is true. We're in a great market. And yes, you can likely sell your home you know, without having to hardly do anything. But we still want to get top dollar for your house. We don't want to just throw it on the market because buyers are still savvy. They still want value. So we need to be putting presenting your home in its best possible light. Deep clean it. I have professional cleaners. Remove any clutter so that people can come in and really truly see the home and experience themselves uh, or imagine themselves in that home. Start packing up if you can. Get boxes, put things in the garage, get a storage unit, whatever you need to do, especially if you have a lot of stuff. Um, take down personal pictures. Uh, it, hide uh, and, and remove special items that could easily walk away during showings. Jewelry, prescriptions, things like that. Declutter the house and prepare for showings. Home inspection. Um, I do recommend a pre-listing home inspection. What is that? That is basically when we do a home inspection for, <laughs> for ourselves and you do it before the listing goes live. Why? It reduces surprises, okay? And it helps us be transparent with buyers. Reduces surprises, it means that if there's something wild that comes up on the home inspection report, you will know that ahead of time versus being surprised by it when you finally get an, a buyer under contract and then you're sitting here like, well, where am I going to get $1,000 from to fix X, Y, and Z? So definitely you've got to, um, I, I recommend, I'm actually doing one this weekend, do a pre-list home inspection. So then you can take care of everything and then you, we, we, once we do the home inspection though, we have to make it available to buyers, but it also says to them, we have done our due diligence. We know these things were an issue. We have repaired them. We are ready to go. This does not stop the buyer though from getting their own inspection. Okay. They still have the right to do that. However, in the market that we're in, they're less likely to go through the hassle of wanting to get a whole nother inspection because that takes time and it's a contingency in the contract that they may not want to have to uh, ask for because they may somebody else may come in and be perfectly fine taking that home inspection um, so when I recommend the home inspection of course we're using somebody that's licensed insured bonded all of that so it's not just a general contractor that's doing inspections pre list and home inspection, that's a big one. I didn't put this up there, but also the termite and moisture inspection can be done ahead of time. So basically you're doing everything you can to say this home is ready to be sold. Ready to be sold. Professional photography, once you do that deep clean, I'm gonna have a photographer come in and take professional photos, pro probably video, and depending on your location, drone footage. And then do those simple repairs things you've been putting off, things you haven't, you know, you haven't wanted to do, but do those things. Know you, again, the market is so great right now, you don't have to do it, but the better you present your home, the more you can get for it. Hey, Latoya, okay, let me see. So, and my towel sit on the slope. Well, so it depends. If they're not structural, 
I would not fix them. So it, are you on a slab? It's sitting a slope. So you, I'm, I'm assuming it's kind of like a little hill. But if you're on a slab, um, I definitely wouldn't do it. But if the contractor doesn't think that they're structural, I wouldn't mess with it. I would maybe have him fill it really nice and paint. And I say that because a lot of times, well, houses move and shift. That's what they do. They're sitting on the ground. The ground moves and shift. I mean, it does it slow, so we don't really realize it. But a house is going to shift over time. It just is. So if it's not structural, just have it filled and painted. Because if when the buyers walk through, they're going to look at the crack and get all in a tizzy over nothing. Um, so I would take care of it before you list, if you can. And is it a is it a condo or a townhouse that you actually live in? Because I know condo style townhouses are really popular in some neighbor in some areas of Hampton Roads. Um, decide on your next location. So this one kind of catches people by surprise, I think, a little bit. What we are I say we, I, I work closely with um an agent, uh, Danielle. And so we try to instill in, in sellers right now, get your money, get your coins. If you really feel like you've moved into a house and it wasn't the right fit, you bought too much house, you didn't buy enough house, whatever the case is, now is the time to collect your coins and move on. So we did have two sellers recently who bought just in 2019, both of them walked away with about fifty thousand dollars, okay, because they were ready to go. They needed they needed to do something different. And the house that they purchased, it wasn't a bad house, but for one of them it was way too big. Actually, for both of them it was too big, so they didn't need that much house. So they decided that they were going to sell and go into a temporary rental. Y'all, that's okay. It's okay because guess what? The rental is the same amount as their rent. I mean, as their mortgage, it's the same amount. So you're not losing, you're not losing anything. Okay, you gotta live somewhere, but they still got that fifty thousand dollars in their bank account. So they downsized and they went to temporary rentals until they decided what they wanted to do. They were trying to figure out: Am I gonna relocate? Am I gonna stay with family? Am I gonna move in with a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Whatever the case may be, it's time to get your coins. That's the whole purpose of this um, of this presentation tonight. So you've got options: temporary housing whether that's a short-term rental, extended stay hotels, or staying with family. So then if you don't want to waste that rent money, uh, you can stay with family if you can stand it. You could look at purchasing another home. So if you uh, want to just go straight from your current house to your new home, there is a little bit of a transition that needs to happen there. Um, and that is where the rent back comes in. So it's a little out of place, but it's okay. Or you may be relocating like to another state. Um, you could do a rent back. So if you sell that home and your new place is not ready, it is possible for you to do what we call a rent back from the new owner. Meaning you guys go ahead, sign the paperwork, you close on this home. In other words, you go ahead and get it sold. You sign the deed over to the new buyer, but you need to stay behind for a week, two weeks, three weeks. That can be worked out with the new owners. So just because you close, you aren't just going to be put out, you know, on the, on the curve and not have anywhere to go. But you need to have a game plan for what you're going to do, particularly if you're looking at buying another home and that home may not be ready. So getting pre-approved, I put this on its own slide because if you're looking at purchasing another home, you do have to go back through the process of getting pre-approved again. <clears throat> people ask a lot whether they can possibly keep their current home as a rental it is possible but that is something the lender needs to needs to decide for you um well decide for you meaning your income has to be enough in order for you to keep your current home and make a payment on your new home so it has to be enough and if you have a certain amount of equity, used to be a 20% rule. 
then you may also be able to keep that current home and buy another one. So it just is going to depend on your financials. So you've got to talk to a lender about that and they will tell you because some for some people, you know, you may not be able to keep your old home and buy a new one because your your you know, your income may not be high enough to do that. So you've got to talk to your lender um, so that you know where you stand. So handle those things um, before you list your house. <laughs> those things need to be taken care of before you list your house. Because you notice I haven't gotten to the list part yet. We're not there. Um, okay, let's wait. So it's a townhouse. So it's on a slab. Honestly, <clears throat> slabs, you have far less um, issues because it's a slab. People, Some people like slabs, some people hate them. But I would say he doesn't think it's structural. You know, there's no major shifts happening, which you would be able to tell. Uh, just, you know, have him fill them, do what he needs to do and paint them. That's what I would do. Again, you've had them checked out professionally, so, you know, it's okay. <clears throat> Kitchens and baths. I put this here because this is still where you get the biggest bang for your buck when you're talking about selling a home. Kitchens and bathrooms. Now, I'm not talking about, I know this picture is really fancy. I'm not talking about this, you got to have an HGTV kitchen. No, you don't. Especially if you're in a starter home. You do not. There are lots of different things you can do to fancy up that kitchen. You could paint, you could paint the cabinets, you could change the hardware on them. You could put a new countertop on the old cabinets. You could put new floors in. Even just like changing the light fixtures and the plumbing fixtures can make a world of difference in your kitchen. So you don't have to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or anywhere else and spend $20,000 on a kitchen. Do not do that. Just make it look nice. Um, and some of those things for people, if you bought a starter home, you may have already done some of those things anyway. If you haven't, it's okay. We're just going to price your home according to what the market is going to get you. You don't have to flip the house in order to sell it. Don't have to do it. Everything just needs to be in work in order. Bathrooms. This is the next big one. Focus on the primary bathroom. I put primary here because we are not supposed to be calling them master bedrooms anymore, but that is what I'm talking about. So we're not, not calling it a master bedroom. We call it a primary bedroom. So I'm referring to the primary bathroom. If you have two bathrooms, focus on the primary bathroom where the adult, the married couple, whatever, whoever it is, is, is staying. Cause that's where everybody really cares. That's, that's what they really care about is the primary bathroom. If you only have one bathroom, then make that one look nice. Do what you can. Same thing applies, new floor, you know, even, so in a bathroom, you can change out the cabinet, may only cost you $200 or so, but it can make a big difference in the bathroom. Um, so consider doing that and the spring is coming. So Lowe's and Home Depot, they are always running sales. I know the Lowe's by me has all of those bathroom cabinets out in the front, um, with matching mirrors and all that stuff that they're advertising. So that is something simple that you can do. So make, just make your home look nice. Now we're in the selling process. So we've done all of this preparation. Now here we are. You've selected your agent, you have prepared your house, you've decluttered, maybe you have a pre-listing home inspection, and now we want to list. So listing it officially means it goes into the, M we call it the MLS, the multiple listing system. Um, sorry, service. So it go that is where all licensed agents put our listings for the public. We put them all into the MLS. And I know this is sometimes confusing the buyers, but when you we get a listing we put it into the mls it populates to all of those online sites that everybody likes to use zillow redfin trulia whatever it is it goes all there <clears throat> so it goes live and so now you prepare for showings but hopefully you've already started to do some of that because you've decluttered you've moved your you know your special jewelry and your prescriptions and you've taken now your personal pictures all those things you've done all those so you're ready for showings be flexible is my first um, recommendation because right now there are so few homes people are going to be fighting to get into your home that's just the bottom line they're going to be fighting to get into your house um, most agents myself Personally, I use a listing 
um, service, a, sorry, a showing service that helps to actually schedule appointments um, versus everybody wanting to come at certain times. Sellers have the upper hand so much so that we can kind of demand certain showing times. Um, so in other words, <clears throat> maybe you only want to allow showings between 12 and four, you know, Monday through Friday. That's just what it is. You know, sellers have to get, buyers have to get there. Uh, somebody has to do maybe a video walkthrough, whatever they need to do to make that time work. Um, the other thing that kind of helps to reduce showings and having people in and out of your house constantly is open houses. <clears throat> so I have kind of gone back to like doing open houses because we can get everybody in on a Saturday maybe, and then you don't have to be, you know, constantly in and out of the house allowing people to come and do individual showings. So we try as much as possible to, possible to reduce the inconvenience to you. Um, but you definitely got to get as many feet in the door as possible because that's how you get more offers. So accepting the offer. In this market, you probably will get an offer within a few days, if not a week. If you don't, um, if you don't, then something is wrong. If you're not getting an offer within the first week of your listing, you are not priced right for the condition. So we have to remember that even though there is a supply demand issue, buyers are still very savvy because they can go online and they can look at all the houses on Zillow and they can see if the houses are, uh, ooh, hold on. Okay, computer get ready to die. They can see if the houses are all priced about the same or if something's more expensive. Buyers aren't there. If your house is $20,000 more than the house that just went under contract, they're not gonna come look at it. They're gonna save it on Zillow and wait for you to drop it. Okay, so even though the market is great, we still have to be um, priced correctly for our condition. Now, whether <clears throat> people decide to bid more than what you're listed, that's great but price correctly. So if you're not getting an offer within a week, there's an issue with pricing. When we get those offers, we vet them and review them as I talked about in the couple of slides ago. And so um, based on what we review, we'll talk to you as the seller about who has the best offer. I will tell you sometimes the best offer is not the highest, okay? We ran into that a lot last year when people were absolutely going crazy, offering twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars over asking price, um, the the bottom line is this is where experience comes in with agents because you we look at some of those offers and we know if some of them are just absolutely ridiculous. If somebody's offering so much over asking price that we know it is not going to appraise for that because let's be real, we got to go back to reality. Most buyers are getting loans here. So it still has to appraise. So if they're if they're making outrageous offers, it may look good on paper, but a good agent, AKA myself, is gonna tell you this is not realistic. So what happens is you're gonna get under contract with them at this outrageous price. The contract is gonna end up falling through either because the house doesn't appraise for that amount or um, the buyer doesn't have the cash to make up the difference between the appraisal and what they actually offered. So that's a waste of time. You've wasted time on the market now. So we're gonna review and vet those offers and give you our recommendations on who is the best one. And it's not always gonna be the highest price. Not always gonna be highest price. Um, well, Latoya, they weren't really on sale. Um, Latoya's asking about the vanity sales. They weren't really on sale. You know, I to be honest with you, I haven't really seen sales per se because I guess everything is still on a shortage, but they did have them all out displayed, you know, all pretty, I guess, for the spring spring changes. <clears throat> so uh, lastly, we're gonna, once we get accept an offer, we're gonna close on the sale. So in between accepting an offer and closing on the sale, you do have the home inspection. If the buyer is gonna do their own, you have termite inspection, you have appraisal. So really that's what takes, you know, takes up the 30, 45 days. If you bought so long ago that you don't really remember, that's just a reminder for you. Um, there are things that happen in that time frame that um, you know generally take time to, to process. 
So within that 30 to 40 days, hopefully you're solidifying what you're going to do, where you're going to go. Are you, you know, what your plans are. And if you're looking for another house, this is when you're going to be doing that, trying to find something to get under contract for yourself. Now, with that being said, keep in mind, it's a double-edged sword for sellers. Yes, you're going to get a good bit of of money from your sale, but you're also going to have to go back out into the market and compete with buyers uh, in the same fashion that people competed for your house. So, but at least you have the advantage of now you've cast this equity in. And so you have some, you've got a leg up on other buyers, particularly first time home buyers that maybe don't have cash um, to, to put behind themselves in this, in a sale, I mean, in a purchase. So here are just a couple of myths. And if you guys have more, post them in here. Happy to, to you know go through them. Um, myth number one, my mortgage has to be paid off completely. No, it does not. Uh, I mentioned earlier, looking at your mortgage statement, <clears throat> as long as you have um, some wiggle room in that mortgage statement, you can sell your home. Um, commissions, all those things come out of the proceeds. So basically, what it the proceeds is what is left after the mortgage is paid off and after the commissions is what you net is what you get so remember if you think about it like a paycheck your gross you see it on your pay stub and then they take all the things out and then you net whatever is actually deposited to your bank account that's what the difference is going to be so the mortgage is actually going to be paid off at closing by the settlement attorney. You don't even have to deal with that. Uh, they will get your more official payoff from the mortgage company and they will handle the transfer of all of that. <clears throat> that is the way that it, the process goes. Um, someone men did mention to me last week that they had to have a copy of their deed. No, you don't. You don't have to, if you can't, I mean, ideally, we would like you to have copies of that stuff, but do not let that stop you if you don't. If you don't have a copy of your deed, if you don't have a, have a copy of your old closing statements, um, surveys, any of that stuff, it's not absolutely necessary in order for you to go and sell your home. So don't let it stop you. <clears throat> do you need money up front? No. You don't need any money up front to sell. Um, I will tell you though that sometimes some agents, depending on who you select, they do ask for potentially being reimbursed for photography and, and drone footage and all of those things if for some reason you decide to pull your listing before it sells. Um, and that's not new. That's just something that maybe doesn't happen that often, but let's just be honest, some of that stuff has gotten really expensive. So there are agents that will say, hey, if you decide that, you know, after we list and I've done all this marketing for you, you don't want to um, to continue to sell with me, I would like you to reimburse me for <clears throat> X dollars, you know, whatever that is. So that's the only time you may need money to handle things. Um, the only other thing is if you're doing some repairs, you could potentially need some money in your, you know, available to you to handle some repairs. But even with repairs, I have contractors and a lot of agents have contractors that will handle things for you and be paid at closing. So even for some of those things, you don't need money up front. They will be paid at closing. And so that invoice would come out of your net proceeds in that situation. Um, you have to sell your house before you buy another. Yes and no. So you don't have to completely sell and close on your house before you get under contract to buy another house. Uh, you just have to have your pre-approval, you know, go through the normal buying process and be prepared, you know, to, to kind of have some flexibility a little bit in your schedule so that you, you close on your original home, you got either a rent back, you have somewhere to stay or something, you know, some, some location that you can go and put your things at until you close on your new house. Um, so that one is kind of a, mm, that's kind of a trick, a trick question in a way. Um, so here are my contact details for anybody that needs them. Of course, you can always contact me on Facebook. I'm at Remax Peninsula. 
I did not have their logo on here, <clears throat> but I'm at Remax Peninsula. This is my email, Rashida at Settlin757. And then of course my cell phone number. And most of this I think you can probably find um, on the website or somewhere else. This video is probably gonna stay up for a while because I want people to be able to refer back to it. So if you guys have questions, let me see. Can I stop sharing this?